David Williams here in Christ Jesus. Are you walking by faith today? That's always a question that we are constantly considering. We are constantly considering whether we are walking by faith or if we are making decisions by sight. Are we walking by faith or are we walking by sight? We're evaluating that. We are considering that. We are striving to ensure that we are living by faith. When you walk by faith, you make decisions that the Spirit of God communicates. When you live by sight, you make decisions according to beliefs that you have that derive from what things look like physically in your moment as you interpret the past. Now, hopefully that's not a complex explanation, but it is always an explanation that we'll give in one way or another. It's going to sound the same because what we're saying is that we are either judging our lives, we're either judging matters based on God's voice or based on our blind and deaf interpretation of life as we see it. So there's life as God reveals it, and then there's life as we see it. There's a difference between what God is saying is happening and what we are designed in this condition to perceive. So hearing the voice of God is not the same as looking at your world and believing that it will operate a, a, a particular way. So we've always got God's word as a as an example. We've always got God's word as an example because that's the basis for our ability to answer whether or not we're walking by faith. Are we walking by faith or are we walking by sight? So we're here in Judges chapter 7 and hopefully you can see that. If not, I may back up a little bit out of your way so that you can get a better view of what we'll be focusing on. All right, so we are in Judges chapter 7 and it starts off like this. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, this sounds similar to what Jesus said reveals at the end of Matthew 13. I think it's at the end of Matthew 13 where it says that and then it reiterates it in Mark chapter 6 where it talks about how Jesus could there do no mighty miracles. I'll show you that here at the beginning of Mark chapter 6 where it talks about Jesus could not do miracles in his home town in his own country because of the mindsets, because of the mindsets of the people that were in his hometown. So look at this here. This is Mark chapter 6. And Jesus says this in verse 4. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, this is reiterated or stated again over here at the end of Matthew 13. Let's go down there. Let's see. Verse 57. Matthew 13, 57 says, And they were offended in him. Another word for saying that they were offended is to say that they were angry. They were angry at him. They were envious of him. They were angry at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So it's going to specify why Jesus couldn't do miracles in that area. Now, many of us don't like 
the way that it's stated over here in Mark chapter 6. We don't like that it says that he could not do any work. It, because we know that with God, all things are possible. So we don't like the fact that it says that God could not do something. But there's a reason why the Spirit of God puts that there like that. Why, why, does he, why does he word it that way? He wants to emphasize just how bad pride is or just how bad unbelief is. He wants to warn us of just how bad fear is or just how bad unbelief is, just how bad pride is. And so here it says that Jesus could not do great miracles in his hometown in Galilee. He could not do great miracles there, particularly in, in Nazareth. So it says, he, it says he could not, but we know that he could. But why is it saying he could not? It's saying that he thought it was a, he thought it was a really bad idea, a really bad thing to do. That he he thought it was not to be done. He thought it was unholy to do miracles at the same scale. He's saying, well, these people reject me, so it would be very bad to to help them yet they reject me they reject me they re, they reject me in their hearts they they don't they don't want me here they don't believe that my father loves them they don't believe that my father is for them and they they would rather be right in their own eyes than start following my instruction for their lives. So it would be abhorrent. It'd be really bad. It'd be it'd be really bad to do miracles here. That would justify them in their state. Look, no, they they don't they don't love me. They don't want me. And so I'd be casting pearls to swine. I'd be doing things that they would turn and mismanage and misuse. So this is similar to what it's saying over here in Judges 7 when it says that the Lord is telling Gideon he has too many people supporting him for, for him to give them the victory. He says that there are too many Israelites. There are too many Hebrews. You you attracted too many soldiers. Yes, your anointing drew them. Yes, I'm cleansing the area and people have more confidence. People have more courage. But he's saying that as they come, he's saying that as we as we come to God, as we go to God, he's saying that he 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 wants to do miracles for you, but he's saying that he wants you to obey him after he does the miracle. So if he sees that you are not going to obey his voice after he does the miracle, then he will minimize the miracle or postpone the miracle until you are going to do you're going to do what you are supposed to do once the miracle does occur. Now, that's an act of love. It's an act of love when the Father does not spoil us in that sense, when he withholds things from us to chasten us or to correct us because he knows that if we get too much too soon, we'll disobey him. So there's a prophet over here in Judges chapter, uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 30, uh, and his name is Agur, the prophet Agur, son of Jekai. Uh, that's so. This is so. This is Proverbs thirty. The words of Agor, the son of Jekai, in the prophecy. The man spoke to Ithiel, even to Ithiel and Ukal. Verse two. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the holy. Then he begins to prophesy. He says this: Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? 
who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? And then he continues to say this in verse 7. Two things have I required of you. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. What's he saying here? He's saying, he's asking God to give him what he can handle. He's asking God to bless him with what he'll manage well. Spirit of God, bless me to the extent that you still have access to me. The prophet Agor is asking God not to make him too rich, meaning, Spirit of God, don't give me too much money. And his definition of too much would be to say that he has... The, um, he has so much money that now he dismisses God. He doesn't think God is a factor. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, don't give me so much money that I now shut my ears and ignore you. He's also saying, Lord, don't make me so poor. So he's acknowledging that, that it's God that makes rich. It's God that makes poor. That's what he's saying. By the Spirit, he understands the power of God. He accepts the holiness of God as the one in full control. He says, Spirit of God, don't bless me with so much money or with so many relationships, influential relationships. Don't make me so wealthy that I ignore you from that point forward. He's also saying, Spirit of God, don't make me so poor that I disrespect your word and steal to survive. He's saying, Lord, I'm aware that in my flesh, I'm capable of operating in pride if I have too many options. If I've got too much control, I'm going to rebel. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Spirit of God, if you give me too much money, I'm going to disobey you because I'm going to focus on my money. He says, Spirit of God, I sense my desire to survive. I sense my desire to survive. And if you make me too poor, then my killer instinct will kick in. My survival instinct will kick in. This is what Jesus is telling us to pray when he says that we should pray not to be put in tempting situations. We don't want to be tempted to rebel against God through pride. We don't want to be tempted to rebel against God through fear. He's saying, Spirit of God, I need what I need to obey your voice. He's saying, Lord, bless me to the extent that I obey your voice. Don't bless me beyond my ability to obey your voice. Don't curse me beyond my ability to obey your voice. Lord, don't bless me beyond my ability to obey. Spirit of God, don't curse me beyond my ability to obey. Give me what I would need to stay in your will. God, only give me what I can handle. Because if you give me more than I can handle, I'm going to demonstrate that. All of us are going to do that. If you say that you have more than you can handle, what we are saying is, I am sinning. I am using what I have to disobey God, or I'm getting what I think I need out of desperation. He's saying, Lord, don't make me so full of matter that I can't feel you anymore. Lord, don't keep, don't deprive me of things to the extent that I, I feel like, God, I'm sorry, I've got to steal this. I've got to do this. We don't want to feel that desperate will to survive. We don't want to feel that other emotion. So we don't want either of those emotions. We don't want this desire, this killer instinct to survive. We don't want this idolatry that says, my money is my master. We don't want either of those two conditions. And so 
if the, if the Lord says over here in Judges chapter 7 that the people that are with Gideon are too many for him to give the Midianites into their hands, he's saying to, 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 to give that many Hebrews the victory would confuse the Hebrews. It would confuse the warriors. It would confuse the nation. It would confuse the other nations. He's, he's saying it wouldn't be that great of a miracle. He's saying 32,000 soldiers versus 150,000 soldiers. He's saying that wouldn't be impossible. He's saying, I want to make it impossible because if he makes the job impossible, but yet you do it, the world will know. The whole world will know. You will know. The whole world will know. The angels above will know. The demons will know that it was God's favor that granted you this exaltation. You were exalted. You were supported. You were favored by God. That's what God wants to communicate. God wants to demonstrate his love. He wants to demonstrate his care for you. He wants to demonstrate his commitment to you. He wants it to be known without a doubt that he's for you so that you are for him. God wants to manifest in your life through impossible situations. So the Spirit of God says you've got way too much support to think that victory is a result of God. That's what he's saying. He's saying you have too many soldiers for me to, to bless with this victory. He's saying with that many soldiers, the people will think it was their military skill that won this battle. He's saying that's what I want to avoid. He's saying I don't want you to go back into idolatry. I'm delivering you from idolatry. Why do people drift off into idolatry? Because they think that the thing they are trying to replace God with is the basis for their prosperity. So they stop following God because they stop believing that God is their defender. They, they, they stop believing that God is their supporter. God is their supplier. He's their provider. He's their guide. He's their father. They stop thinking that he can support them. They start believing that something else needs to support them. So God doesn't want the Hebrews confused. God doesn't want you confused. God wants you to know that it's your faith that enables you to stand. The word of God says that by faith we stand. So if we were walking by sight, we would say the more money we have, the more prosperous of a life we'll live. That's what we would say. If we were walking by sight, we'd say that since Gideon is already outnumbered, he needs more soldiers, not less. He needs more support, not less support. So when you are walking by sight, when you are living according to a limited view of your world, you think you need more friends, not less friends. You think you need more money, not less money. You need more cars and nicer cars and more clothes, not less clothes. You need more access to paradise-like atmospheres. You don't need less access to palm trees and white sandy beaches. No, no. You know, so so we in the flesh, we think that the natural world and its features are the basis for success. And the Spirit of God says, 
He is the basis for success. God is saying he's the one who promotes. God is saying he's the one who blesses. And so he tells Gideon, he says, the people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves. See that word vaunt there at the, uh, the middle of verse 2 there? Lest Israel vaunt themselves. What does vaunt mean? It means to boast. It means to lift up yourself. It means to express this confidence, this pride, this, this, this passion that says you know what you're talking about, that says you're in control, that says you understand, even if you don't understand. So it's this strong response to feeling like you are in control, even though you're not. It's this strong response to feeling like you know what's happening, even though you don't. So that's what pride is. Pride is a false sense of security, a false sense of of, of, of superiority. That's what pride is. And God is saying, I don't want these people to think that they have more power than they do because then they, they won't listen to me. They, they, they won't obey. So God will sometimes take you to a low place. The, the Paul talks about being commanded. He says, I am instructed both to a base and to abound. The man of God will have different seasons of his life where God is blessing with great material abundance for his will. And then there will be seasons of a man of God's life where he lacks material things to do what he needs to do. Yet God will still be doing things that that man of God needs done. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, we've got examples of this. Elijah the prophet is an example where the Spirit of God is blessing him with what he needs. But then at some point, Elijah runs out of what he needs and the Spirit of God takes him elsewhere and blesses him through someone else. So initially, Elijah is depending on God. The ravens are bringing Elijah bread and flesh in the morning and in the evening. And Elijah is stationed by a brook of water. The brook careth. So he's stationed by a brook of water. This is over there in 1 Kings 17. So Elijah is being provided for by God, by his spirit. God is having ravens bring bread and 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 flesh bread and flesh two times a day two times a day in the morning and in the evening the spirit of god is, is having ravens come and bring elijah food and if he needs to drink he's, he's near a brook of water so while the rest of the hebrews are starving and they're dying of thirst elijah is being provided for but God says, that's enough of that. Now you need relationships. I want to bless someone else through you. What does God do? The word of God says the brook dries up, telling us that Elijah can't live off of bread and, and flesh. He needs water to survive. So God says, well, you can't stay here. I'm taking you elsewhere and you'll be able to survive over there. So God can, he can take things or withhold things from a faithful person requiring that this faithful person connect with someone else and requiring that this person with whom, with whom they're connecting provide for them so that they are blessed. Let's restate. The Spirit of God will, at times, during certain seasons, withhold things from you, requiring that you establish a relationship with someone else so that he can bless them as they bless you. Sometimes God wants to bless you himself. Other times, God wants to bless you through other people. If you are faithful, God will bless you himself. And if you are faithful... God will use you to bless others by positioning them to bless you. B 
because God is promising to meet every need that you have. He's promising to position you to prosper in his kingdom and in this natural world. He wants you to operate in ministry, in dominion, in authority. The word of God says at the end of Matthew chapter 10 that if someone gives you something to drink just because you are a man of God, just because you are righteous, just because you are a devoted person, they will in no wise lose their reward. So God rewards people for blessing faithful people. He rewards them. He blesses people who may not be faithful. He blesses people who may be hardened in their hearts. He blesses people who might not yet have faith. The Spirit of God will bless them through your presence as a productive man of God, as a man of God who produces things that people need. Because Elijah, the glory of God on his life, is going to enable that woman there in Zarephath to have the, 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 the grain, and to have the oil, she, so the oil isn't going to diminish, and the grain, the grain that she has, isn't going to diminish. So the Spirit of God is miraculously providing for her because she's providing for him. So there are people throughout this world that God will only bless if they are blessing someone who is faithful and productive by the power of the Spirit. So the Holy Ghost will bless people who bless other people who are mighty in God, who are mighty in the Spirit. So because this lady is providing for Elijah, the glory of God on Elijah's life is enabling her to have what she otherwise would not have what she otherwise would not have. And so if she doesn't want to give Elijah what Elijah needs, then she's not going to get what she needs. The only reason why this lady is going to be able to survive this severe famine is if she provides for Elijah, the man of God. And that's, that wasn't an isolated situation. Jesus explains that at certain points in Matthew chapter 10. So in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is empowering and sending out his apostles and he's telling them that the workman is worthy of his hire. He's saying, if you are a faithful person, if you are someone who produces his power, if you are someone who brings healing to people, if you are someone who brings transformation to people, he's saying that, that the people you minister to, the people that you provide for, he's saying, as you provide spiritual things, he will be commanding people to provide material things for you. He's saying you provide spiritual things for them. They provide material earthly things for you, enabling their survival, enabling their survival. So if, if Elijah is manifesting the glory of God in the earth, if he's manifesting the fruitfulness of God, if the power of God is on him to resurrect the dead, if the glory of God is on him to cause it to rain or to prevent it from raining, if the spirit of God is moving wonderfully and mightily, mightily in his life to bring great measures of transformation in the lives of people, the people who bless him, the people who provide for him because he's providing for them, because he's an access point to blessing, because he's a door of God's provision, because he can manifest God's will, righteousness, and judgment, because he can walk in that as these people provide for him, they are going to be provided for. So this is not conjecture. This is not bad belief. This is not vanity. These are not lies. It's actual. If people want to provide for Paul, then Paul can heal their sick fathers. If you want to house Paul as a wealthy man, 
then he'll heal your sick and dying father. The man is wealthy, but the man's father is dying. He's sick. He houses Paul, and Paul lays hands on his father, and his father is healed of sickness. And so the Spirit of God will provide for those who are ministering for God by his power and by his anointing. And so God is telling the Hebrews here, I'm talking to Gideon. He's saying to Gideon, listen, if he's saying, uh, and so, so, so he's telling Gideon, he's saying, You're, you, you have too many soldiers for this, this endeavor to, to, to look like a miracle. You've got too many soldiers for this to look like a miracle. So God can withhold resources from a mighty man of God, from a person who's devoted to Jesus Christ, he can withhold resources to require, to, to, to show a miracle, to show a miracle. He can do that. He can do that. He can withhold resources to, to uh, do a miracle. He's saying, what I'm about to do in your life, you need to understand is a miracle. I, I, I'm going to bless you, but once I bless you, you'll need to know that I'm the one that blessed you. He talks to the Hebrews and says, beware lest you forget the Lord. And so God is warning the people. He's saying, as I prosper you, as I promote you, don't neglect me. Don't reject me. Don't Start idolizing the things I've given you. Don't start disobeying my laws because you are too busy washing and, and cleaning and folding and tending to what I gave you. He's saying, I, I want to bless you, but I don't want my blessings in your life to separate us. God is saying, I don't want there to be separation between me and you because I did a miracle in your life. And that's exactly what he's saying. What happened here with these Hebrews, he's saying, if I bless this many people with this victory, the people will think that it was their numbers. They'll think it was their material resources that brought them this victory. I want this battle to be identifiably miraculous. I want this endeavor to have my name all over it so they'll be loyal to me, so they'll be faithful to me. So to walk by sight in this matter would be to say that Gideon doesn't need less troops. Gideon needs more troops. He's outnumbered and the enemies have been oppressing Israel for seven years. So Gideon is saying we are at a disadvantage already. We don't need less material support. We need more, more material support. That's what the flesh would say. That's what the carnal mind would say. That's what fear would say. That's what pride would say. That's what the blindness that happened to man back in the Garden of Eden. Eden. That's what blindness would say. Pride would say we need more materials. Faith would say we need the support of the Lord. Faith would say we need the command of God. All right, so what do we have here? Now, therefore, go to, this is verse 3. This is Judges 7, verse 3. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. So the Spirit of God is blessing Gideon in that he's connecting Gideon with his laws. God when God wants to bless you, he will bring you into alignment with his word. I'll say it again. When God wants to bless you, though he might appear to you in some unconventional way, but when God really wants to bless one of his sons, he will 
bring that son into conformity, into compliance with his word. So God will let you do things that will seem untraditional, non-traditional, that God will let you do things that seem illegal. God will let you do things that seem like they are above the law, but in God's righteousness, he will bring you back into conformity with his word. If, if we are men of God, we are going to be in compliance with his word. If we are hearing from God, God will tell us in the future what he's told people like us in the past. If we are actually hearing from God, the spirit of God will bring us back into compliance with his word. Word he's spoken before we were born. Before our ministries started, if you're really a man of God, if you are really a woman of God, as the Holy Ghost speaks, he will bring you into compliance with utterances, with instructions he's given in the lives of people of God who reigned before you. So Gideon is here. He's a man of God. But there were other men of God that existed and operated and prospered before Gideon. One such man of God, his name is Moses. Moses was told by the Spirit of God to set parameters and to give instructions for going to battle. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy 20. So Gideon is hearing from God by the Spirit. But, again, a person who hears by the Spirit might feel like he's independent, might feel like he's got the right to say what he thinks he's hearing, what she thinks she's feeling. So to be hearing from God by the Spirit might cause a person to feel like they're not subject to the standards God has set in his word. But as in another situation in Gideon's life, here God's going to bring Gideon back to his word. Here a little, there a little. Yeah. So God is operating in his spirit and in his truth. He's not just operating by his spirit. He's not just operating by what he's defining as his truth. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Any child of the kingdom is going to bring forth out of his treasures things new and old. No, every word of God is pure. And so if we are really sons of God, our paths will include new revelation and it will incorporate rightly divided old revelation. If we're really hearing from the God of the Bible, that God will be talking to us in a way that connects us functionally with truths he's stated in the Bible. So we're not so prophetic, so sensitive that we can operate outside of the mighty apostles and prophets who spoke and who prospered in the Bible. So what do we see here? Gideon is being sent against the Midianites. That's war. Gideon is to make war with the Midianites. And what happens? He's to build an altar. He's to build an altar. Is someone from Manasseh allowed to build an altar? We went over there to Deuteronomy 33 and said, wow, in God's law, there's a small provision that says that the descendants of Joseph can operate in the chief things of the ancient mountains. That's where Moses got the law from. The Moses was given authority in the ancient mountains. Authority is the chief thing. So there are many things, but that word chief is a reference to king or top ruler. And the word of God says that the descendants of Joseph, it says that Ephraim and Manasseh can get chief things 
from the ancient mountains that they can operate in particular ways. Now, not every person in Manasseh or every person in Ephraim will be able to rise up and possess these things. No, the word of God lets us know that God gives these things to whom he will. So if Gideon is saying, the Lord told me to build an altar. Well, Moses said that only the Levites could do that. But Moses said only the Levites can do that. And Moses is a chief who became a chief in an ancient mountain. So Moses received his calling in the mountains. And he's, he's required to speak over the sons of Joseph that they too, by the Spirit, will be able to operate in the chief things of the ancient mountains. Moses was called to operate in the chief things of the ancient mountains. He didn't take that honor to himself. He didn't promote himself. No, the Spirit of God called Moses to that. He called him by his name. Called him by his name. So the Spirit of God elected Moses, ordained Moses, called to Moses, set him as governor, as judge, as, as it says in Deuteronomy, as king in Israel or Jeshurun, makes him the man of God, makes him the chief authority. God does that for him, did that with him in the ancient mountains of Horeb, mountains of Sinai, God did, God did that. And so Moses got his calling. Moses got his instruction from God in the ancient mountains. And Moses was told to release that authority over the descendants of Joseph. But who's going to get it? The Spirit of God might create this provision. But who's going to get the provision? The Spirit of God might say, hey, this is available. But who's going to get it? Just because God has jobs, that doesn't mean we all are going to occupy every role. That doesn't mean we all are going to be allowed to build altars because we're from the tribe of Ephraim or the tribe of Manasseh. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that if God wants to come back, and promote someone to a position that they generally would not be qualified for, God will have already spoken about the fact that he wants to do that. What are we saying? We're saying that God doesn't do anything he's not already said he's going to do. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. God doesn't do anything in the future he's not made provision for in the past. If you are saying God is telling me to dot, 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 that would mean he's made, He's already spoken that in the past. Jesus Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. And so God, if God does it, that means he said it because he creates how? By his word. So if, if you say, I am in alignment with God's will, that means he already spoke that. If you are in alignment, he already made provision for you to do what he supposedly is telling you to do. So if Gideon is saying, God is telling me to build an altar. Well, let's back up some centuries to see if God set it up for one from your tribe to build an altar. And lo and behold, in Deuteronomy 33, Moses speaks a blessing. He speaks authority. He speaks access over Gideon's tribe, over Gideon's family group. But Gideon is one of the only people able to tap into what God spoke over that tribe. Do you know who else tapped into what God spoke over that tribe in this manner? Another great man of God who built an altar. His name is Elijah. So you've got two mighty men of God who built altars unto God that God regarded, that God respected. You have two mighty men of God, and 
from, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gideon being one of them, and Elijah of the inhabitants of Gilead of Manasseh. Elijah is a Manassite. Gideon is a Manassite, and Elijah the Tishbite is a Manassite. He's from the tribe of Manasseh, and he's got authority. Weren't we already talking about Elijah in this preaching? We were already talking about someone else from Manasseh. And the Spirit of God used him to repair the altar of God. Elijah went to Mount Horeb. The Spirit of God spoke to him. He's receiving the chief things of the ancient mountains. He's got access to it. Just because God makes something available to the family, that doesn't mean he's going to give it to everyone in the family, depending on what we're talking about. Now, everyone in the family can benefit from it. But who's going to get it? Who's going to get the chief role? And so Elijah, so you've got Moses visiting Jesus and Elijah visiting Jesus. Moses is of the tribe of Levi. Elijah is of the tribe of Manasseh. And so Moses says, they can get what I got. That's what he's saying. Moses, by the Holy Ghost, is saying, they can get what I got because God told me. So guess what? John the Baptist is a blend of both. He's going to come of the bloodline of Levi, but in the spirit of Elijah and pass this mantle, this scepter onto Jesus. Yeah, Jesus Christ. So, so, yeah. So John the Baptist is a coming together of Levi and Manasseh by the Spirit. Yeah, that's what's happening there. And they're going to give it to Jesus of Nazareth. And now Jesus is going to govern. So Moses and Elijah show up. Moses and Elijah show up to talk to Jesus about his transition, about his ministry. Moses and Elijah show up. They show up. Hey, we're here to give you this. <laughs> we're here to give you this afresh. Just in case, and who do the disciples, just so that we don't walk away from Matthew 17 confused. When they start going down and Jesus says to them, Jesus said something to them to provoke a response. Why would John the Baptist come up in that conversation? Jesus, he says, don't tell anyone what you saw until the Son of Man is risen again from the dead. And they said, why then say, why then say the prophets that Elijah must first come? He says, Elijah has come and they've treated him like it was written of him to be treated in a particular way. Who killed, who killed John the Baptist? Herod. Herod did. Why? Because his wife Herodias did. So, I, so we wonder, how was it written of John the Baptist that he was to die at the hands of a king? Because Jezebel said that make the gods curse me if I don't make your life like one of their lives. You just killed my prophets of Baal? I'm going to have you killed by this time tomorrow. Guess what? It didn't happen in Elijah's life. He left the earth. Moses died in the physical. Elijah did not die in the physical. So guess what happens? The glory on his life descends and eventually John the Baptist gets it. And he's got to die at the hand of a Jezebel. Jesus said that they did to John what was written of him. Like written of him. But where does it say that John was going to die at the hand of, you know, but, but where in the Bible, Jesus said it was written that John had to die this way. Oh, they treated John like it was written that they treat him. Where? In 1 Kings 19, may the gods do to me and more so uh, if I don't make your life like one of their lives. Oh, you have that man's anointing. Well, he's got a work to do. And one of the works is to glorify God in a particular manner. And it's through death. So, hey, here. 
And so John died that way. So, so John comes up in the conversation. Jesus says, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man is risen again from the dead. And they say, why then say the scribes that, John, that Elijah must first come? He says, Elijah has first come, and they treated him according to what's written of him. Uh, or he says, Elijah will come first. But I tell you this, Elijah has come, and they treated him like it's written of him. It says, and then they understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Why? Because John is a blend of the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets prophesied until John. John is a blend of the law and the prophets. Because he's got the spirit of Elijah on him. The last prophetic book written or recorded in our Old Testament is... Malachi. And and who's brought up at the end of Malachi? Who's brought up at the end of Malachi? Who are the who's brought up at the end of Malachi? This is Malachi chapter 4 verses 4 through 6. Remember you the law of Moses my servant which I commanded him in an ancient mountain in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so in two verses in our last book in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God through Malachi brings up Moses and Elijah. So they are here to trans transfer authority to Jesus. If you have authority, you must get it from authority. Now, God can give you authority before you meet a person he gave more of it to. But if you have legit authority, if it's real from God, that will lead you to someone in the earth who will impart theirs to you, who will affirm what you have, who will pass the mantle on to you and say, now you have the right to operate in what the Father gave you. Yeah, people might not like the fact that God passes that down through people, but God likes it, and if God likes it, guess who else has to like it? You. You. If God likes it, I have to like it. If Jesus of Nazareth had to get it passed down to him through Moses and Elijah, how much more do you need to get it passed down to you in your day? Yeah. And to make sure that things get passed down, he's turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Yeah. So if the fathers don't have a heart for you, they're not going to give you their inheritance. If you don't have a heart for the father, you are not going to walk in their paths and operate in the glory. So if the fathers have a heart for the children, the father's works will not go unfulfilled. If the children have a love for the fathers, they can get the inheritance the fathers have been given by the Spirit of God. Because God is passing the mantle down through the generations. People can, people can dismiss it. But if you want power in this world, if you want access to eternal life, you've got to get it the right way and have it managed by the right people. So we can all believe that we are renegades and desperados and independent. But the Lord is telling us plainly that he doesn't do anything without having spoken it. 
So he's letting us know that if we are not walking in right alignment with his spirit, then there's going to be division between those who have and those who need. There's going to be a separation between those who have stuff and those who need stuff. As you are watching this, uh, we've got a question of where, where, where are you in your faith? Are, are, you, are you ready? Are you ready for salvation? Are you ready for God's glory? Are you ready? Where are you? Where are you? Where, where, where are you? Where are you? If you were to die today, where would you go? If you were to die today, where would you go? If you don't know where you'd go if you were to die, then you need to understand that Jesus is not your Lord and your Savior. Because if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, if Jesus is your guide, if you are consciously serving Jesus... The Spirit of God gives you a sense of assurance. The Holy Ghost wants to, he wants you to know that you are going to spend eternal life with him. He doesn't want you to be confused about where you'd go after death. He doesn't want you to be confused about that. He wants you to know where you'd go if you were to die. He wants you to know. And so this, as you are watching this teaching, this is your opportunity to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. This is your opportunity as you are watching this to recommit your life to him. The Spirit of God wants you to dedicate your life to Him. He wants you to give Him your life. He wants you to decide not to live according to the fallen nature, the course of this world. The world is deepening in evil. It's getting more evil. The world is getting worse. People are becoming more hateful, more violent, more lustful, more manipulative. That's happening in this world. The Word of God says that we need to save ourselves from this untoward generation, from this falling society, from this destructive state of things things. We must be born again. You must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? It means to be transformed from, the, from, from a sinner to a saint. It means to be transformed from a sinner to a saint. It means to be transformed from a bad person to a good person, by accepting the death and resurrection of Jesus. What must I do? What must I do to be born again? You must confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You must, you must say it with your mouth. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. God gave you access to him through your mouth. You must say out of your mouth, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe the Father raised him again on the third day. I confess that I am a sinner and I commit my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Those are things you've got to state. If you state these things, and if you mean this, if you state it and you mean it, the Word of God says you will be saved. He starts you on a path of eternal life, meaning when you die, you'll go to be with God in paradise in heaven until he resurrects your dead body and gives you a glorious new eternal life here on earth. 
He's saying that if you accept him and from that point obey his voice, he is saying he will rescue you from the punishment of hell. He's saying he won't cast you off. He's saying he will forget and forgive your sins. Forgive and forget your sins. He's saying if you commit to him, he will blot out your sins. He'll erase them. He'll wipe them away. He will not bring them up. He won't hold them against you. He'll forgive you. That's what he's saying. If, you, if you're feeling guilty about having lived a life of sin, the Lord wants to forgive you right now. But you've got to confess your commitment to him right now. Today is the day of salvation. Seek the Lord while he may be found. If you've never committed to Jesus, you must confess your commitment with him, to him. And you must be baptized in water. After having been baptized in water, you must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You must confess that you're a sinner. You must confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You must be baptized in the water and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Unless a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he can't see the kingdom. So Jesus right now is inviting you into the kingdom while you watch this now. As you watch this, this is another opportunity for you to recommit to God. If you've fallen away, you can recommit right now. If you've never committed, now is your opportunity. Jesus is coming. There is an afterlife. These teachings are the word of life. They do well to those who who, 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 who apply them. Obey this and you're going to see the hand of God in your life as it's written in the Bible. Otherwise, we will talk. We will talk within uh, the next 24 to 48 hours.